Welcome, Mike. Thank you for your time today. So Mike Sherrard is a realtor in Calgary. You're a relatively new realtor. Yeah. You kind of came out of nowhere, did super well. Uh, mostly, it seems like attributed to social media. So tell us a little bit about what you do in terms of real estate and what sets you apart from the infinite number of other realtors in the city. Definitely. You know, one of the main reasons that I got into real estate was that you know, previously when I was working as an engineer, I bought my first house. And when I bought my first house with these two agents, I'm always cognizant and aware of what people are doing. And I noticed that them and them as a representation of the majority of other agents in the city were very much behind the time. So there was no one who was really active on social media, leveraging video content, leveraging actual platforms that give you significant reach on a dollar per reach value that is you know, unattainable otherwise. And it was very much behind the time, sort of a dinosaur age mentality in the old school boys club of, you know, average age in the early 50s and stuff like that. So I decided to get into the industry and leverage what a lot of the agents down in the States were doing, which was heavy media content, a focal point on building a personal brand and less about the brokerage brand. And by doing that and also combining it with, you know, old school techniques like cold calling and door knocking, you know, the, the labor intensive things that they were still afraid to do, I was able to build a brand and get the ball rolling quite quickly here in Calgary. Very exciting. So you started out, your first career choice was engineering. Yeah. Why'd you go into engineering? You know, it's almost to my own ignorance. You know, my dad and all of my uncles were engineers and they still are. But again, to my ignorance was I'm a big car guy. And being in mechanical engineering, I always had this idea that I would get into mechanical engineering and I'd be designing Lamborghinis and the wind tunnels or designing cool cars and stuff like that. And then reality set in after I graduated and it was oil and gas designing pumps, dragging and dropping on software and things like that. And I realized that, wow, I didn't do my homework and I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, and that sparked um, some excitement for change. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh, was the catalyst that made you make the switch from engineering to real estate? I started reading books in my latter years of university. So in the last two years before I graduated, I started reading books like the typical Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Think and Grow Rich, stuff that got me thinking about a different lifestyle that I otherwise didn't know. My, my only focus otherwise was get in there, climb the corporate ladder. One day you could be a GM and that was like the, the dream. Um, and I started getting these new perspectives on life. And anyways, I was doing really well and identified as a young prospect as an engineer. And I had a meeting with all of the managers that said, you know, Mike, where do you want to go in this company? You know, we're here to help you get there at an accelerated rate. And I told them because I like to deal with people and I like sales and, and being creative and marketing, I wanted to get into oil and gas sales. Um, and their, their response is very clearly, okay, no problem, we'll get you there. It just takes five to seven years of technical experience. And as soon as I heard that despite all of my efforts and my extensive amount of overtime and you know building the right partnerships with the right people within the company at such an early age that I had to adhere to this corporate structure of five to seven years behind a computer at a salary no other opportunities I I just understood that that wasn't the right fit for me <laughs> so um, that in combination with that being around the same time that I bought my first house and saw what the majority of agents are doing in this city. I saw a blend of getting out of the corporate world, getting into an industry that I was always passionate about, but also had an opportunity to express myself creatively and get compensated based on my time and effort. So that's how I fell into real estate. <laughs> Very cool. So what did your friends think about you going into real estate and starting the whole Purple Realtor brand? It was crazy, man. You know. I'm not from Calgary, so I'm from a small town in New Brunswick and it's very communal and everyone knows everyone and I came out here to start as an engineer and, and just change up the lifestyle a bit with more opportunity and I had all these people that I was insanely close with for my first year and a half while living here and we did everything together. Every Friday and Saturday we were out together, we were always on trips to Montana, we were doing everything. 
Um, and I thought, wow, you know, these are going to be the people that are going to be stoked for me. I'm probably going to get new business from them because they're going to be buying their first homes from me. Um, it's going to be fantastic. And it didn't play out that way. You know, it, it seemed like a lot of people were resilient to someone going out and doing their own thing in, in a time where you would hope that people are going to support you and, and be there for you because it's a struggle. Um, it really fell flat and I lost a lot of my friends and I, I stopped getting reached out for to go to parties or anything like that and it, it almost collapsed from right from underneath me and I was alone um, in a time where I really needed people there because I was you know putting myself out there and going against all odds uh, being a young person not from this town in an industry where experience mattered um, so yeah man it was really tough you know a lot of my friends weren't a fan of the purple car, thought that you know BMWs are egotistical enough, let alone wrapping it in a purple color, that, you know. And then getting on social media before I, I became a realtor, I had no social media platform. So these people, and maybe it was just not what they were used to seeing from me. So again, maybe this is something that I just don't understand from their perspective, but not being on social and now suddenly taking selfies and videos and things like that, um, was not the norm, but it, I knew that that's what I had to do to stand out in this business. And that again, put them off even further. Um, so there was definitely a select few that really stood by me and still to this day um, are reaching out and have supported everything I do. And I thank God for them every day. Um, but the large majority fell, fell off the, the boat. So how did you, what kind of things did you do to cope with that loss of friends and that not feeling that support? Definitely, you know, there's a quote from a rap song by Jay-Z and then basically someone says to Jay-Z that um, there's not enough of us basically in this, in this rap game and the successful ones and, and he replies saying that there's plenty of us in the sense that, you know, what he's saying is sometimes less is more and what I really realized over that duration is that previously I had sort of this perspective and I think it's again something coming out of university where the more people you're around the better. You know, if you're at these huge house parties with 50 people, you're popular. If you're doing this stuff with, in big activities and big groups, you're popular, you're feeling good. And what I realized is that I had a lot of distant relationships, but I didn't have a ton of insanely close relationships. And during that time I formed those. And now I'm so much happier with having a few people that would shout your name from the top of a mountain or bend over backwards for you than having many people that are more so acquaintances when you think about it uh, a little bit deeper. So now the people in my life are people that would support me no matter what. Um, they're amazing and they know that I would do the exact same for them. So I'm so much happier. Um, maybe a minimalistic approach, but it's changed my perspective um, in everything I do. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your personal brand, because that's a major factor in your real estate success and the idea behind the purple car and all of yeah. that. Yeah, you know, as you alluded to, you know, I went out on limb. I quit engineering the comfort zone and I got into an industry where, you know, I don't like to look at it as self-employed. I like, I like to look at it as unemployed. Every day you wake up, if you don't work, you're unemployed. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that perspective. And I knew that I had to stand out because everyone told me when I was, you know, putting feelers out there, telling people that I was gonna get into this industry, they were saying, you know, well, what about this person? They own this neighborhood. And what about that person? They own this quadrant. And I knew that there was names out there that people recognized. So I had to find a way to get my name out there. And what I realized is that came down to your personal brand. And for me being young, having no, end, no uh, you know, real estate experience, my friends aren't old enough to buy or they're not supporting the, the journey. Um, I have nothing. So I had to find a way to get out and meet people. And the car, this is one of my biggest pieces of advice to people building a personal brand is it needs to be authentic. It needs to come within, it needs to be natural because then it makes it so much easier um, to be transparent. So I knew I was gonna leverage my car but I wanted to do it in a tasteful way that stood out. You know, I met with the people that were doing the bus benches everywhere. And I realized that was like $250 a month that I didn't have. Um, so I thought about it and I said, if I could create almost a rolling billboard that was tasteful, 
not like the agents that have their face plastered on the side, but something that appealed to the masses and also millennials, that would be pretty cool. So I chose a color, but I wanted it to signify something, you know, because I didn't want it to be this bright lime green bug or anything like that. When you look at color psychology, purple represents ambition, loyalty, and luxury. And that's what I wanted my clients to perceive from me, whether it's a hundred thousand dollar property, million dollar property, $10 million property. I wanted them to get a luxurious experience across the board because I knew that agents were skipping corners on the, on the cheap properties and they were you know, spending a lot. People weren't getting the customer service they deserved across the board. So I knew that I le would leverage the car that way. Um, and then social media, as you very well know, social media content has the ability on an insanely cheap budget to reach the masses. And by building a brand that people resonated with, by, by voice and the content that I put out, people started picking up on who I was really quickly. They started seeing me get up at 4 a.m. and resonated with my hustle. They started seeing me be transparent about my failures and my pitfalls and they knew that I was real. So I started doing all these things that people had never seen before in Calgary or were you know, cognizant of and it really helped drive a lot of attention to me because they felt like I was, they were almost a part of my journey and that's where the brand started. You mentioned you had quite a bit of success initially with some Facebook ads for a builder. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Definitely, you know, again, real estate is a very personal business and a lot of realtors, I feel, lose sight of the fact that they're doing stuff for other people and a lot of them get caught up in doing stuff for themselves. And that's dangerous because then what that does is that translates into their advertising and all of their advertising turns into copies of ads that they would like to see themselves, not what a consumer would like to see. So they fall short from providing value to actual consumers and what people would want to see. So you had this mass of agents that finally realized that social media was important and finally figured out how to run their first Facebook ad, but they basically took a template of their bus bench and put it on Facebook and put a budget behind it. There was still no value. You've never had to pay for a home evaluation in the history, so stop advertising for your home evaluations. So again, I like to reverse engineer things and put myself in the consumer's shoes. And I said, you know, if I was the general public, what would I love to know that I would not otherwise have access to? And that was information on new bills that were not yet advertised. So what I did is I did my homework and started looking at the new communities that Calgary had approved. And I went down and started meeting with the builders and said, listen, you know, I've got a strong social presence. Would you give me the opportunity to sort of promote your build to the public before it goes live and try and get you guys some leads. And the crazy thing is, is not only did they say yes, but their marketing team had to approve my ads. So I gave them my ad budget, the copy, the photos. I gave them the rubric of exactly what I was going to post. Mm -hmm. And they said, sure, run with it. And I did. And in 24 hours, I did $40,000 worth of business with a $40 Facebook ad. Because what I did is I gave the community something that they didn't have access to yet, but they were excited to know about it because it was a new vibrant community that there was buzz about. And ever since then, I've just been finding unique ways to put myself in your shoes and say, what can I give you that's actually valuable? Not just what everyone else is providing that you can get on realtor.ca. And a lot of people don't think from a consumer's shoes and that's one of their biggest pitfalls and why you know, they get so doom and gloom about ads. They put a big budget behind it and see the reach is crap. It's because they're not thinking about what would people actually want. Yeah, that's really important, especially in the, the business to consumer space, that's huge. So you mentioned too, when you're starting out as a realtor, Obviously, being a realtor is very expensive. Like I, I'm in the understanding that it's around 20 grand a year minimum to like just to for all of your expenses yeah. and brokerage fees and all that stuff. You said you had some tough months where you were living really frugally and uh, trying to deal with those expenses and not necessarily having the other side. Tell us a little bit more about that. Definitely, you know, 
Real estate is certainly an expensive industry and a lot of people fall short, especially here in Canada where, you know, a lot of people look at these shows, million dollar listing, and they have this ideology that they're going to get into real estate. They're going to start getting these million dollar listings in Aspen or Springbank, and they're going to be making 20 grand a pop all the time. And they don't understand that that's not the truth. Not only, you know, do people not understand the business aspect of it in the sense that you don't get paid till, you know, three months after you close a deal, but also getting deals. So for me, what happened was I came out and I hit the gate running. I was door knocking from day one in the snow. I was cold calling every day. And what I did is I built up this momentum, but similar to university where they don't teach you practical life skills, the real estate license doesn't teach you practical business skills. So what I didn't understand is that when things are going well and you build up this momentum, you can't let up. That's the time where you have to take your momentum and double down on what you're doing to build that up. I let off the gas. And what happened was I went through a few months where I did no business. And that was scary because I ended up having, I think it was $287 in my bank account and my monthly running expenses were $4,000. So if I didn't close a deal that month, I had a mortgage, I had my car, I had business loan, I had everything. And it's a lot of stress. And that's why a lot of people don't fail because they don't understand how to properly run their business in the sense of keeping the fundamentals and the dollar value added activities at the forefront and not chasing the shiny penny. Mm -hmm. um, and I chased the shiny penny. I was putting too much focus on, you know, the content and the new ideas and what I, what, what I could try. And I stepped away from what was actually giving me business. And that was, one of the biggest learning curves ever um, and why a lot of people fail. So you've kind of built systems now to make sure you're always getting new leads and stuff then, hey? Definitely, yeah. I, I built a system but also built a schedule um, and one that I can follow because one of the things, and this applies to you know, self-employment or entrepreneurship in general, is accountability. You know, when you go from the corporate world you have a boss. So if you don't do your tasks that day, you're going to hear about it. But when you're self-employed, using myself as an example, if you decide today that you're not wanting to door knock and you just want to work on, you know, some creative Facebook ads for four hours, you can do that and no one's going to tell you otherwise. The problem is you can do that for months and no one's going to tell you otherwise. So what I did now is I've held myself accountable to the schedule. I have accountability partners and I use tools like Facebook live and video live videos to force myself to stay accountable to the public so they know what I'm doing. And by creating these systems, um, you never run dry and sticking to the basics that you know is going to keep your pipeline full. Cool. Okay. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit here and go into some actionable stuff yeah. for people in terms of social media. So obviously my company is based around making social media content. We create a ton of video, photo, stuff like that. But what kind of content do you suggest realtors make more of? Because uh, a lot of realtors, you just see a listing, they'll just post a link to an MLS, MLS <laughs> listing on Facebook or yeah. whatever, or like just random, completely pointless or relevant content. What kind of content do you think they should be creating? Definitely, man. That's, that's an excellent question. It's something that's more relevant now than ever, as you very well know. And, you know, again, I, I saw an excerpt from a book that I was reading the other day, and it was essentially saying that, you know, realtors know they're in a person to person business and it comes down to who you are and people understanding your personality. Yet they continue to post, open houses and just listeds and just solds and they're not giving people an example of who they are. So my biggest recommendation is you need to give a very transparent, authentic insight as to who you are because people decide to work with usually the agent that is the best reflection of them or the one that they can relate to on the most common ground and agents continue to post basically a homes and land magazine on their social media feeds of properties that are just Google imaged, not even theirs. They're not providing any valuable insight as to why that property might be unique. They're not doing anything that gives people a real example of something they don't know. And they're not even giving examples of what they're like. 
And that's where agents fall short because what you want to do based on your social media is when someone meets you after six months or for the first time, they want to feel like they already know you. And agents aren't doing that. They're not posting content about their kids or their lifestyle, but the passions about what makes them tick. You know, I met with an agent the other day and he said, you know, Mike, I'm not even, I don't even feel like I'm a realtor. I almost cringe when I hear that word, even though he is one. He said, you know, I'm a problem solver. Buying and selling the house is just a small portion of what I love to help with. The problem was, is that none of his social media feeds projected that message. And he's so sincere about it. And if people knew that's what he stood for, I can guarantee he would get double the amount of business but he wasn't even sharing his message. And that's where agents are falling short. You know, they have conversations like we're doing now and they tell their friends, you know, I got into this industry because of my passion for learning or teaching or helping or problem solving, but they're not sharing that with anyone. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest problem is that they're not portraying their message. All they're doing is portraying a translation of what the rest are doing. Yeah, for sure. But you see that in a lot of industries, like the brands that are getting more successful now with their marketing are the ones that show off the people that yeah. are behind the brand, right? Like nobody wants to just see an ad for a discounted product, but they want to see real people and engage with real people. And that human connection is so powerful when it comes to marketing. Big time. Yeah. And you're even seeing companies now like the big oil and gas companies and things like that, that are actually investing in getting you know user generated content you just see from their employees because they know how much bigger a message from one of their employees is on a platform like linkedin or instagram about the company than it is for them to publish it so people are understanding the importance of the message and the human aspect of it and for whatever reason agents know this is what's required and they still fail to portray it. And I think a lot of it comes down to analysis paralysis. You're working on starting a personal branding agency yeah. now, which is really cool. You just, you just launched what, today, yesterday? Just launched today. Just today. Launched today, so that's super <laughs> exciting. Yeah. So let's see if we can go into some tips on how people can make better personal brands and build better personal brands Definitely. and build that following. Where's the best place to start? Definitely. I think the best place to start is within, and as cliche as that sounds, you need to understand why you're doing it and who you are. Because again, going back to why I use the car, you know, if I tried to use sports, um, basketball as, you know, my passion, well, it's really not. And I can't speak to people, I can't go up to you and have a conversation about what happened at the Super Bowl yesterday. I truly can't. So if I tried to tap into a group that I can't relate to and portray an image that isn't authentic to me, then you're going to have a really tough time finding content to create, videos to produce, posts to do. You're going to struggle. So I think people need to look within and say, you know, what are my passions? What sort of groups can I tap into based on that passion? And how can I get creative with it and share my message? Um, so really you need to look within and say, who am I? What do I want to stand for? What's my voice? What do I look like? Do you, do you want to be more like a Tony Robbins or do you want to be more like an Oprah or do you want to be more charitable or what, what do you see yourself emulating and then blend that with those passions? So a lot of people, and I find this all the time in our work, <laughs> are terrified of being on camera. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people are terrified of putting themselves out there and the opinions out there and stuff, obviously because they're scared of what other people think and what other people are going to say and what are, how other people are going to view them. Do you have any advice on overcoming those kind of fears and reservations? And was that an issue for you? Definitely, man. You know, it's really exciting because last year I started taking note of people that I knew because I made a post last year, January 1st. I said, you know, what are your goals for 2018? And a lot of people were saying, get more on social media, get more video content. So what I did throughout the year is I started keeping an eye on those people that said video content and it was really neat. It ranged from people that were, you know, 18 all the way to 65. I had some older people on my Facebook that wanted to get into video. Some of them were in MLMs or whatever it might be, but they knew that that was the new wave. And it was exciting because a lot of them decided to go live on video as sort of a forced discomfort to get them out there. And now they're forced to do video. And 100% of the time, 
the comments were littered with people supporting them saying, I'm so pumped that you got on video. You did such a great job. You looked amazing. I can't wait to see the next one. Please give us more of this. 100% of the time. So you had these people that were so beyond scared about doing video because they had this, you know, I guess forced blanket in front of them saying that, you know, people are going to make fun of them. They had all these ideologies made up that they were scared what people would say, not knowing that everyone was backing them. So I feel like people just need to dive in two feet and do something that would maybe force them to get out of their comfort zone, like live video, um, or do it with a partner and have someone join them on video, which makes it a bit more comfortable. Um, but largely it just comes down to consistency and patience and persistence. You know, you need to get familiar with the camera. And my biggest tip to people is understanding that you're not speaking into a camera, you're speaking to an audience. And when I shifted that perspective from speaking to an object to speaking to an audience, that's where everything changed because you watch these YouTube videos and understand that it feels like you're there. It feels like you're speaking to a person. And that's what people need to understand about video content. Yeah, I think some people too, like when you're a teenager and maybe even your early 20s in college and university and stuff, you tend to get razzed a little bit more. But it seems like as you grow up a bit and have friends that are your age, yeah. like they're more supportive when you're an adult, right? And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that most of their friends will be really supportive of that. Like I've, uh, I've had multiple clients that we've gotten on camera and the results they get on their videos from their friends is just overwhelming. They're like, this is so awesome. I love that you're doing this. I love that you're yeah. doing this business and they're sharing it. And sharing yeah, it's, so. uh, yeah, and it's so, video is so much more powerful than just posting a photo of yourself or a selfie or something like that. It is, and it's, it's even nice to see people when they're trembling a bit or quivering or stuttering because it makes it so much more real and authentic. Whereas you have these people that are, are waiting for that perfect moment to be video experts and they've got their script mapped out and they've got the lighting and the cameras and they're gonna be pristine. And that loses its touch because it seems fake. Whereas these people that are going out on a limb and trying, you can tell that it's real and it's them. So a lot of people resonate with their content more and are more excited to see it. And not only that, but a lot of the times you see their friends now a little bit more excited to try video because someone took the initiative to do it and they saw that, you know, it's really not that scary. Yeah, I really enjoy seeing the progress too. Like we have quite a few clients that we do multiple videos with and it's pretty amazing going from like that first video and how awkward and uncomfortable they are to like maybe 10 videos later when they're much more relaxed or much more confident. They're like, oh, I've done this a bunch of times, it's chill. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's like, that's such a cool progression. And I can't remember what I was reading the other day. Maybe it was a blog article um, or a social media post, but they were saying, that it's a really good idea to make regular videos and put them on your YouTube, even if they're unlisted, even if you don't make them public, just for the practice of talking to a camera and putting yourself out there. And then later it's a lot easier to, to release those videos and do it even if those initial videos you don't plan on showing anybody, any of them. Um, so going back to the, the personal branding stuff. Yeah. So you start putting yourself out there. Um, do you have any tips on brand consistency when it comes to personal branding? Definitely. I think that's one of the biggest things. And again, why specifically in real estate, a lot of people fail is because they lack that consistency. You know, one of the biggest things that I recommend to people is that's why finding your voice is so important in your message, because let's say you have one really nice post and some people come across it and you know, it's ranking high on Instagram and, and it's getting your most likes and maybe it had a motivational tone to it. And then your next picture is one where you're partying or you're hungover or something like that. And then the one after that is something that has nothing to do with your business. That inconsistency drastically reduces the retention of your audience because if they come across that first photo and they really like it, they want more of that. So they're expecting more of that to come. And if you don't do that, the retention dwindles and they'll start unfollowing your journey because now they have no idea what to expect and now they don't know if they resonate with your content and they're no longer excited to see what is next. So that's why, you know, personal branding comes down to so much more than just your social media following. You know, it's a voice, it's a vibe, it's a look. And you need to portray that in your content so that people get used to it 
And the ones that stay become firm believers and those are the ones that are gonna buy your product or use your services or come back for more because they really resonate with you and have built up that trust and almost a, um, you know, an online relationship with you. So consistency is king for sure and so is, is being transparent with your content. Yeah, so maybe actually we can use me as a, a sort of bad case study here. Um, I built my entire pretty much Instagram following and a large uh, portion of my Facebook following, which is much, much smaller, on parkour. Yeah. And because uh, I, I used to compete internationally and most of my followers came from that. So most of my followers are like 13 year old kids that just want to <laughs> see flips. Um, and then I transitioned really into the business and photography. Yeah. And originally I was really on the fence. I was like really didn't know which way to go if I wanted to post, just post strictly parkour on my Instagram or start a new Instagram for photography or mix them. And I ended up, I reached out to some people on Facebook, a few people that I kind of thought did well with personal brands. They said, I'll just post your photography on your parkour Instagram. But you can see when I post entrepreneurial stuff or photography, the likes are like, 10% of what they are when I post parkour stuff. Yeah. So obviously I'm not making any money off the parkour stuff at all. Um, so I wanna try and transition more into the business stuff, but occasionally show that parkour is still a part of my life. What advice do you have for people like me that are in a transition phase there? And do you think I should be mixing those things or do you think I should be like phasing out the parkour or separate accounts? What do you think? Definitely no, I think it comes down in that situation to the intensity of the parkour demographic in the sense that if you've actually built a very solid following and it's largely parkour people and you've got probably 80% or more in that demographic, I would personally say start a separate channel and really leverage them. And whenever you have a new parkour video or photos or whatever, harness that group because they're very structured and they're very tightly knit in terms of what they want to see, right? And what you're seeing is if you do a very, you know, drastic shift, they're no longer engaging and the retention will actually drop. Whereas, you know, me, for example, where I just had to do a transition today, I just had to change, you know, a brand I built for two years, the Purple Realtor into Mike Sherrard and focus more on my personal brand. I was able to do that with the same account just because the business I'm doing now still relates to the vast majority of the people that followed me from the beginning. Whereas people that have a, an extremely segmented niche, I say try and leverage that because that's got a lot of power, especially if it's one that not a lot of people are active in, right? Yeah, the only issue is for me is that like I went from previously posting parkour daily pretty much now yeah. to like once every two weeks I'll throw a, a clip in there. So like I'm not really trying to leverage that that parkour following and I yeah. really don't know if it would, if there's, obviously there's ways I could leverage it, but I don't know if at this point in my life with what I'm trying to do and my goals that it's very valuable. But I also don't want to start an Instagram from scratch again. For sure, you know, if, if that's the case, you know, looking, it's, it kind of seems like you've done some soul searching and you, you now understand where you want to go. And I think if that's sort of the pivot that you're making, then of course it makes sense to maintain both. Because if, you, if you're not going to, you know, make yourself a prominent figure in that niche, then you have to blend both. Then it's just a tough transition you're going to have to get used to. And unfortunately, it is one that you do have to rebuild some of that momentum. Um, but when you look at it from a longevity perspective, over the years, as you start to build that up, those are going to be the masses that stick around for sure. Yeah, definitely. Maybe your your new service can help with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan. Yeah. So yeah, let's tell us a little bit about the new business you launched and the yeah. service you're offering, and uh, maybe it appeal to some of our audience. Definitely. So. You know, getting into social media, I realized that one, after getting into it for a few months, it's extremely time consuming. And two, I was looking for products out there that would help alleviate some of my efforts on it, that would help maybe grow my platform a little quicker, um, would help me get into my niche a bit more um, without me having to put in the efforts. And you know, we have people talking about the Gary V dollar 80 method where you find 10 hashtags and 10 accounts and put three comments on each. You know, I was doing everything that every video said and it was growing slowly and very consistently, but it was taking up so much time. And again, going back to the shiny penny and understanding dollar value activities, that wasn't one of them. So again, I was getting sort of torn apart because 
I knew that I couldn't do it myself and grow at the pace that I wanted. But on the other hand, all of the things that I was finding online were fake follower accounts, buying them. They were bot accounts. Um, it wasn't in your niche. I had friends that were using them and saying, you know, yeah, I've got all these people, but they're all from India or Brazil or um, places that would never buy their service or their product. And then I was at a loss. So I said, you know, if I can build something that, would, that I would personally use, then that's something that I would hope other people would use. So I ended up building something that organically grows your social accounts in your niche and in your local or your location so that you're getting people that would use your service locally and people that would engage with your content on a national level in your niche or your industry. Um, so that's what we launched is Pivotal Hype. And I'm excited because we're gonna turn it into a true personal branding agency. One of my frustrations was that you have all these online gurus and people with 100,000 fake followers telling you that if you get 100,000 people, suddenly you're this global brand that everyone's gonna recognize and you're gonna be Insta famous and make money. Well, that's not the case because if you know 99,000 of those are not real, then you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't wanna do that. And also, if Instagram changes its algorithm or if Instagram dies or closes, then you've got a big problem because now you've got nothing. So my mission is to help create personal brands for people that will stand the test of time, become top of mind, and it will be applicable across all social platforms that are relevant in the now. So with your service, you have different monthly tiers and you have some really cool add-ons that you're gonna be providing with the services. What are a couple of the add-ons, the extra value adds? Definitely, so again, you know, the social following definitely helps. Um, it's a huge component for the social proof, if you will, and the optics of a personal brand. But it's not everything. And you know, as we alluded to multiple times in this chat is, you know, you need to create a voice. You need to have a message. You need to have a certain look. You need to have a vibe about you and a certain swagger that people will remember. Um, and that comes down to coaching. But I didn't want to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I didn't want to trade my time for that. I wanted to give everyone that same, I guess, education, but I wanted to do it in a way that built community. So with our program, you get private access to our closed groups where we do weekly calls with industry leaders on how to be a leader, how to find your voice, how to do social media marketing, how to find the right content. So in our private groups, we're doing a lot of engagement that gives people the tools that these other platforms aren't giving to truly help you build a brand. And then in turn, we're doing live Q&A to answer any questions if possible. But um, what we really wanna do is build an online community of people that support one another, that engage with each other, that celebrate the wins when they just get a deal from their personal brand leveling up and things like that. Um, because the power of community is, has never been stronger. So that's the vision for it right now. And I'm really excited to help people get the tools that they aren't otherwise getting with these other platforms. Very cool. That's awesome. I'm super excited to try it out. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and where do you see, where do you see your real estate business yourself personally and pivotal hype in 10 years? Good question. You know, 10 years is a tough mark. So maybe we'll go 10 years and then work backwards. So, okay. you know, I thought about this today and I've been thinking about it a lot actually over the last two years is, you know, you hear a lot of people saying the five-year goal, the 10-year goal. And what I realized is, you know, two years ago, I was an engineer. A year ago, I was full-time real estate. Now I've got a second business in the branding, which is one of my biggest passions. You know, every year is changing so quick. And what I realized is that, you know, when I do these goals every year, my five-year goal is changing so drastically, let alone 10 years, that I finally came to grips with the fact that I'm no longer changing a long, chasing a long-term goal. I'm chasing a lifestyle. Um, and the income will follow. So I realized, you know, through traveling and, and my business ventures and just talking to people that I'm chasing a lifestyle of freedom so that when it does get to the point where I'm married and have kids, I don't need to worry about vacation time. Um, if the weather is minus 40 like it is now, I can go on vacation and work from my laptop. I truly want to build a lifestyle. And I know that if I'm good enough at that lifestyle, the supplemental income that will allow me to travel and have the toys and stuff that I like, which are those 10 year goals, that will follow suit, right? So 
Largely, I want to, again, have a lifestyle that revolves around passions and those passions are ever changing. So I think people need to understand that, you know, they need to look at the lifestyle and sometimes their goals aren't leading them towards that. So to get back to the question in terms of goals, what I really want to do is I don't know where it's going to lead, um, but I know that I want to be a figure that is making an impact on a community. And if I can, one, build that community, and then like Pivotal Hype and secondary, if I can start having some of the people comment saying that because of what we've taught them, they're now landing a job that they've always wanted or they're doubling their business or you know they found a new opportunity because of connections they made through us. That's what I wanna do. I wanna make an impact, um, but I wanna make an impact that's the root of my passion and is, it derives from my passions. So what do you see changing in the future for real estate? Definitely, man. So, you know, it's a really interesting time and a really dynamic time in real estate where, you know, if you're not in the industry, you might not know this, but in 2017, a new brokerage came out called eXp Realty. And it's a cloud-based brokerage, which are, is already disruptive, where it's no brick and mortar. You don't have an office. You don't have desk fees. So they're portraying themselves as the Netflix of real estate or the Uber of real estate where you know they're they're attractive to the millennials where now you don't have to pay these huge desk fees that you're no longer using. Two, they're set up like an MLM where you can build teams out of city. Because a lot of people understand that in real estate, one of the toughest things is to build a physical team because you have to put in so much time in training, in person, coaching, training, practicing, role playing. Whereas if you build a team across a nation of people that just like your vibe, then that looked like a huge opportunity. So now you've got these cloud-based brokerages that are coming in trying to disrupt the industry. You've also got these things called iBuyers, which are getting massive funding from venture capitalists, upwards of 400 million to billions of dollars, where essentially an iBuyer is an online website that you can fill in your property address and you'll get an offer on your property right now, today, will pay cash, done. The problem is that's about 70% of the value, but there's so many desperate people in some of these economies that they're taking it and they're scooping up real estate. You have people that are you know, almost trembling about the fact of Amazon potentially coming in because real estate is the only industry that Amazon is currently not a player in. And back in May of 2018, they put up a landing page on Amazon saying, do you need a realtor? And it shut down, it crashed Amazon in two hours because of influx of people clicking. So honestly, I don't know what's gonna happen in terms of the future of real estate, but I think there needs to be a disruption. And that's why I think it's so important for people to create a rigid and powerful personal brand that will stand the test of time because you know, you've got eye buyers coming in undercutting a realtor and cutting them out of the deal. You have cloud-based brokerages that are creating new incentives for agents to leave the typical brick and mortar businesses. You've got Amazon that could come in, buy up something like Zillow and Uberize realtors, where if Amazon has the power and the funds they do now, they could just say, okay, you know, John, this person needs to see this property, they wanna write on it, there's $500 and there goes the huge commissions. If you look at the real estate industry in North America, we get paid three to six times what they get paid over in Europe and the UK. So I think with modern technology, there's going to be a disruption and that's all the more reason for people to need to think creatively about their business, about their brand, how they're gonna find ways to give new value because if they continue to do what's aging, they're only gonna fall behind. And if these transitions truly do come to fruition, I think a lot of people are gonna be out in the industry. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I think you're able to bring a lot of valuable insights and some ideas that realtors should really be taking advantage of in the, the changing and very competitive economy. And I'm super excited to see what you do with Pivotal Hype. Definitely, man. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. I'm excited to work with you and, and hopefully more locals because you know, I truly think it is the golden era of your personal brand and you truly are your brand, whether you're a business, an entrepreneur, an employee, an employer. 
Um, so I'm really excited to help people make some of these transformations and, and see where things go. Yeah, very cool. Thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Thank you. Our first sponsor is Symbol Syndication, which is a video production company that I started. We do video production and online marketing for businesses of all sizes, ranging from solopreneurs to Fortune 500 companies. Our second sponsor is Gravity Cafe. They've been gracious enough to give us their space. The coffee's awesome. They have live music three nights a week. The beer's great. It's an awesome place to come hang out. Another sponsor of the Ambition Project is Business Link. Business Link is Alberta's entrepreneurial hub. They are a nonprofit organization that helps people navigate the steps towards starting their own businesses. Just because you're in business for yourself doesn't mean you're in business by yourself. Business Link's team of in-house startup experts are there to support you all along the way. Our next sponsor is the Better Business Bureau. Your BBB helps businesses build visibility, credibility, savings, leads, and community through BBB accreditation while funding free marketplace services with more than a million instances of service to consumers every year. Visit bbb.org forward slash Calgary to learn more today.